pleading. When you plead, I plead just like that. Today I'm trying something different, a different backdrop, a microphone. Feel a little goofy, but here we go. You'll have to stay tuned for the end of the video because like always, I will include a chart that I use while studying for the bar exam that hopefully you, if you are a visual learner, can benefit from check it out think of pleadings as a tango you need two people to tango in this case you need the plaintiff and the defendant i'm going to analyze it first from the plaintiff side and then from the defendant side and see how they are both pleading together with each other and with everyone who goes first the plaintiff because the plaintiff is complaining with the complaint and what is a complaint? Short, plain, short statement that says, what's the problem and how are we going to resolve it? In legal terms, it's the plaintiff is saying, this is a claim, this is the issue, and I'm going to demand for relief, which is how are we going to get this resolved? It has to be a short and plain statement. The court doesn't want to read through long long things even though they do and in the complaint the plaintiff needs to state ha, needs to include a statement that says the subject matter is jurisdiction now we're in federal court and we've talked about this a bit how does a court have subject matter jurisdiction over a case well you have to look at both diversity jurisdiction or federal question well you have to look at both of them to see if one of them applies as a refresher, diversity jurisdiction is when the plaintiff and the defendant are completely diverse from each other and the amount in controversy ex exceeds $75,000 and it's pled in good faith. Federal question jurisdiction is when the issue arises out of question out of federal law, the constitution, treaties, all that good stuff. So if either of those diversity jurisdiction and federal question jurisdiction, well, either or, either diversity jurisdiction or federal question jurisdiction is satisfied, then subject matter jurisdiction is satisfied. So that's one part of the equation. It's subject matter jurisdiction plus the claim, what's the issue, plus the demand for relief, which is how are we going to resolve it? Claim, what happened? Was there a breach of contract? that's a cause was there a car crash that's a cause whatever the cause may be you have to state it you just can't submit a complaint that says i want to sue defendant because defendant is ugly no that is not a proper basis but you can say i want to sue defendant because i had entered into a contract with defendant um, to paint my house and defendant did not paint my house well there's a cause, there's a claim. Now, demand for relief, it has to be either monetary value or it has to be an equitable remedy. Meaning, suppose we're going back to the example, I hired defendant to paint the house and defendant didn't pay the house. So I'm suing defendant for breach of contract. Now, what can I receive in response? Um, they can ask him as an equitable remedy to paint the house, specific performance, like paint the house. Or I can get the value that I was going to pay the what I paid the painter back. And that's a monetary. You just need to say, how is this problem going to be resolved? I bring it forward to the court. I, I need something because something wasn't done in simple terms. There's heightened specificity for specific types of claims. Those arising from fraud, mistake, or special damages. <laughs> if either of those three come up, then the short plain statement actually has to be specific. And the level of specificity depends on the state that you're in. So you're going to have to check that out for more information. 
Okay. So I, the plaintiff, wrote the complaint, filed the complaint. What happens now? The defendant gets served the complaint. And the defendant is faced with the choice. What do I do? Do I answer? Do I ignore it? Definitely don't ignore it. But if you respond to it, you have two different options. You can either file a motion, which is presenting a document in front of the court in which you're asking the court to decide, to make a decision on something. And then if you answer, it's basically saying yes, no. You may want to say maybe so, but that's not really an answer. So I'm going to dive delve in more into motions and answers and see what happens when the defendant does either or. Okay, quickly. If there's service of process, the defendant has 14 days after receiving the complaint to respond. However, if the service of process is waived, then the defendant has 60 days to respond. It's important to know because in the bar exam, they will ask a question, present different scenarios and be like, oh, the defendant took 54 days to respond. Is that okay? Yes, no, no, all of the above, yes. The answer is a question. Did defendant waive the service of process? The fact pattern will let you know. Something to look at. I'm going to talk about the 12B motions. What are those? I've heard them. I've heard that term being term <laughs> thrown around. Well, the 12B motions are the motions to dismiss before a trial. This is when a defendant responds and says, no, this claim is bogus, but these are the reasons why I want you to say it's bogus. So we have the first one, 12B1, and that is lack of subject matter jurisdiction. As I mentioned, the federal court can have subject matter jurisdiction if either there is diversity jurisdiction or federal question jurisdiction. A slight review again. Diversity jurisdiction is when the defendant and the plaintiff are completely are from different states from each other. They're completely diverse. And the amount in controversy is more than $75,000. The amount in controversy is the demand for relief. Okay. And then we have the or, the federal question jurisdiction, which is when the in the complaint, the plaintiff alleges something from federal law, treaties, the U.S. Constitution, all that good stuff. 12B1, subject matter jurisdiction. 12B2. Lack of PJ, lack of personal jurisdiction. And that is when the court has jurisdiction over the person. Does the person have minimum contacts with the forum state? That's a good question. If not, thrown out. 12B3, improper venue. Is the venue correct? Are any or all the defendants from that forum state? Or did elements of the claim arise in this location? If not, goodbye. 12B4, improper process was the complaint filed correctly just very procedural issues if there's a problem you may want to raise it it could get this the case could get dismissed 12b5 improper service of process was the complaint delivered to a minor child not in a person's domicile was it not delivered in person was it left in the person's car. You have to look at the state's uh, uh, laws regarding the service of process and see if service of process was proper. If not, if it was not proper, you can dismiss it. Goodbye. 12B6, this is the most popular one. This is the cool kid. Failure to state a claim. If you get a complaint and you're like, wait, there is no claim, there is no issue. They're not telling me that I breached a contract. They're not telling me that I, uh, committed a tort. If there is no claim, this one can go goodbye. 12B7, 
failure to join an indispensable party. An indispensable party is a party that's necessary to be able to give, I, I don't know, sometimes it's hard to describe these. It's on the tip of my tongue, but an indispensable party is someone that is important, that you need in order to give relief properly. If that person is not involved in the case, then the case cannot be fully resolved. Those are the 12B motions to dismiss that the defendant has 14 days to raise after receiving the complaint or or 60 days if the defendant had waived the service of process. Okay, so we have delve into the 12B motions. Some of them are waivable, some of them are not waivable. Waivable means that if you don't raise them when they're supposed to be raised, you lose the opportunity to raise them. So, those are numbers two through five. This means 12B2, lack of personal jurisdiction. 12B3, improper venue. 12B4, improper process. And 12B5, improper service of process. If the defendant does not raise these in his first response, then he loses them. Okay, there are three that are not waivable, which means that you can bring them up during other periods of time, whether pre-trial, during trial, after trial, and those are 12B1, lack of subject matter jurisdiction. This one never expires. You can bring up any time, any time. Then you have 12B6 and 7, which are failure to state a claim and ooh, failure to state a claim and failure to join an indispensable party. Those can be brought up up during trial. After like there's a hard line halt that says after trial nothing. But you have a better chance of playing these cards a little later. Why is this important? Because if you are later on in the trial and you realize wait a minute this venue is improper. The defendant can't go and file a motion and be like, can I dismiss this case? Because this state is not a proper venue. The judge will be like, did you raise it when you were supposed to, when you responded to the complaint? No, I did not. Well, you lost the opportunity to raise it and now you must defend this case and it's improper venue glory. So Lots of technicalities can happen, and you don't want to be stuck in that pickle or predicament, so pay attention. Pay attention. As I mentioned many moons ago, the defendant has two options, either to file a motion or answer the complaint. Now we talked about all the motions, now I'm going to talk about the answer. And the answer, the defendant has to say yes or no. Not maybe so, not leave a blank. It's important not to leave it blank because if you leave it blank, the court will be like, he's just saying yes. And then you may end up saying yes for something you did not want to say yes for. So say yes or no. You can also raise affirmative defenses to defend your yes or no. And those include statute of limitations. You could say, wait a minute, this uh, breach can only be brought within two years, and this is the fourth year. So, yeah, it must be dismissed. Well, that's a question for the court, but you have that right to bring it up. You can bring up a statute of frauds affirmative defense. And I'll go more, in, I'll go more into the statute of frauds in all its glory and details when I cover contracts, but that's a good time to raise it. Self-defense is another one res judicata if there has been the same a similar case between the same parties and the judge has already come up with a decision and why can't it be applied to this one that is a good time to raise it in your answer when you're raising your affirmative defenses now suppose the defendant does file a motion to dismiss a, a 12b 
something another uh, 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 two, five, and seven, and they all get denied. What happens? Well, the defendant has to answer the complaint, has 14 days after the judge denies the 12B motion to say yes, no, and raise the affirmative defenses. It's a little bit tricky, but just think of it this way. If you have a motion, if you want to dismiss the case because you say, oh, it has, doesn't have subject matter jurisdiction, doesn't have personal jurisdiction, uh, the venue is bad, raise those first. If the judge says, you're right, then the case gets dismissed. Then you don't have to answer the complaint. But if the judge says, no way, Jose, everything's okay. And you're like, okay, I guess I better answer. And then take the time to raise your affirmative defenses because that's the only time you can bring them up. So it's about timing. Keep in mind the dates, the times, the courts, the procedures, because in civil procedure, everything is about making everything fit into its little box. If you're not paying attention, you can end up suffering a penalty through a technicality. So watch out. Thanks for watching. Please subscribe. As promised, I will now include a chart from my study materials. And see you next Wednesday. I think I'm going to try a different backdrop because it looks like I've left a green screen, but nothing exciting has been changed. And I'm just trying out different things to make the content more engaging. And let's see what we cover next week. See you then.